Okay, we're back live in Silicon Valley at Storage Networking World. We're here with special guest Val Berka Vici. You got it. All right, all right. <laughs> he is a, um, I want to say chief scientist, CTO, strategy, but he's a tech guru at NetApp. Um, very. He was uh, in marketing for a while, but they kicked you out, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in like view. He's like he's in research. He's you know, sniffing all the trends. We're at the the largest trade show conference in storage and or infrastructure called SNW, where a lot of action in the storage business is changing. A lot of new opportunities. This place is growing like crazy. It's a gro- explosive market. We're seeing, you know, the likes of Facebook, Twitter. Apple, Zynga, all these new new applications, new user experiences, all kind of being enabled day by by data, by new infrastructure. And storage is an industry that's changing from disks and spindles to st- storage farms to actually being a core part of the engine of infrastructure that's creating massive amounts of wealth, great user experiences, and new technology. So, Val, welcome to the Cube, where uh, we're going to extract that knowledge from you and get it out there and share with everyone. Uh, Dave, Val, just quick. Big data is a hot trend. It's changing the storage business. We were talking before we came on live that virtualization, been there, done that with NetApp. You guys are doing it uh, you know, with VMware, Citrix, yeah. whatever VMs you can, you can get your hands on. It's kind of old. Mm-hmm. But now there's a new tornado happening, and that's around this big data, something that Dave and I have been tracking very heavily you know, for over a year now. And uh, I want to dive into that with you. So sure. first, tell us what's going on in the marketplace right now uh, in this SNW, the, you know, the South by Southwest of storage, we're calling it <laughs> earlier. What, describe to us what you're seeing out here. A couple of really interesting and timely trends. I think uh, probably the first thing I'm seeing is that there was a lot of theory about cloud at SNW and other similar events last year, yeah. but not a lot of adoption of real cloud-like deployments, whether they're private, public, hybrid, etc. This year, for sure, I'm seeing real practitioners, real adoption of cloud technology uh, under various categories, and the names are becoming less and less relevant to me. They satisfy the characteristics of economy of scale, of self-service, of chargeback, so it feels a lot more real to me. As I mentioned to you earlier, I see a real distinction between the kinds of applications that are being used in the cloud that distinguish a traditional cloud. I'm calling it Cloud One. It's a term Mark Benioff and and you know Bill Coleman and some other industry visionaries are using right now. Cloud Two is really all about a new style of application, and it's you're seeing it a lot more prevalent in public cloud services, services at scale, particularly. I think of virtualization not along a machine boundary, but along a services boundary. So various elastic units of compute, various elastic units of, of networking, and certainly various elastic units of storage with different policies and, and you know, s- profiles. That is really what Cloud2 is all about. And big data is a huge part of that. And one of my strong beliefs, though, as a former application developer, is that you know, data by itself you know, isn't very interesting. There's a lot of new code being written, new applications being written to drive value out of that new data to literally monetize it in many cases. And new code doesn't happen you know, in a vacuum. It actually nowadays is being deployed on new platforms. Platform as a service is hot. And that combination, I think, of you know, platform as a service maturing in 2011 is really the coming out year for platform as a service combined as a storage company with a lot of data, big data, is that hot confluence of trends that I'm seeing drive a lot of activity. And the startup community is responding. We're obviously here in Silicon Valley where they host us for, I think, for the first time or first time in a long time. Um, there's a lot of innovative startups out here. A mm-hmm. uh, bunch of net, net, ex-net app folks we, we talked right. to earlier. Yeah. But this is really innovative right now. And, and can, you, can you give a peek for the folks out there what you're seeing in terms of the key innovations are from startups and tour, kind of yeah. what net app's thinking about? Well, I think a lot of the key innovations, interestingly enough, are certainly coming out with how do we optimize virtual machine hypervisor based clouds so whether it's you know vm specific storage solutions certainly the maturity of uh, vm oriented data protection solutions at netapp we have this term this engineering term we call vm granular data management so it's being able to natively operate with a vm unit of granularity for everything you do whether it's provisioning some capacity whether it's tweaking it for performance whether it's setting policies for availability, for recoverability, recovery points, recovery times, and so forth. Using that as a core unit of granularity is really, really important as you have VM sprawl or just as you're starting to manage VMs at scale. So I'm seeing that certainly um, as a big trend at this show. 
Uh, and I'm hearing, hearing a lot of talk, you know, certainly a lot less product delivery, but a lot of talk around next generation application platforms. And again, that next generation of virtualization, which is all about, you know, much more scalable uh, platform-based environments and, and big data type infrastructures. So I haven't seen a lot of, for example, Hadoop-oriented announcements at SMW this year, and I expect that to actually change quite a bit. Is that because of the vendor list that's, that's here? Is it because of the people that are here are kind of, I don't want to say clueless on Hadoop, but Hadoop has really come out of the open source community, yeah. obviously as we know, um, yeah, It's a developer-led yeah. initiative, right? It, yeah, I mean, it's, it? it's developer-led, it's very new, quite frankly, particularly to storage people, and I, I see actually some really clear distinctions, organizational distinctions that explain a lot of activity here. So this is very much an IT operator kind of show. It's, you know, I have to operate IT, I have to purchase storage, it's optimized for operating uh, applications that I'm used to. So whether it's custom applications, whether it's, you know, packaged applications, PeopleSoft and so forth, SAP, Oracle, uh, I operate that environment. I don't write those applications. So I need solutions that help me maximize, you know, the efficiency of that operation, you know, practice that I run. Uh, Hadoop is an example of very, as you said, Dave, an application-driven trend, an application developer-driven trend. And what's really interesting right now is I've seen a pendulum shift between, you know, the, the, the amount of business value in operating a packaged application is diminishing over time quite rapidly now. Whereas the amount of business value in monetizing all the information we're collecting, and think about the sensor data alone, all the RFIDs we walk by, the barcoding, machine-generated information, you know, smart meters and so forth. There's an overwhelming amount of information right now, and you can either just drop it, or you can actually keep it. And extract find, it. And extract it yeah. and then mine it. And you, you, sometimes you mine it in real time because you know what you're looking for, but interestingly enough, if you're able to retain it at a low cost, then you're able to mine it over time and find value, latent value you never knew was there. And it's not sample sizes anymore, it's not estimates, it's all your data. Yeah, and that's it's what's everything. exciting here, it's everything. It's the real deal. Yeah. It's entirely the, the, the fingerprint of right. business and or anything, yeah. right? And we, we sort of call it as, you know, there's a lot of HPC techniques being used to do that from a technical perspective, but now instead of being, you know, relegated to scientific labs or a couple of specific genomics applications or whatever, you're seeing HPC going mainstream. Yeah. And that basically is one of the ways I describe Hadoop and, from and a Dave, business context. And Dave, we talked with um, you know some of the, the entrepreneurs out there, and one of them that we like is Marco Pacelli with ClickFox, um, out of New York, not known in the Silicon Valley circles, but you know it's like a fifth startup. He talks specifically about that business value and that the data mining actually has for the first time, yeah. clear business objectives. So the elusive, what's the ROI right, that's right. been this phantom or pre or fabricated <laughs> um, metric is now real data. It is. And so. that you can, you should have it available and that people who don't do it yeah. are going to be kind of either out of business yeah. or... <clears throat> and, and you mentioned Marco and he even made the statement, it's, it's really not about the infrastructure, it's about the applications Absolutely. on top of that. Couldn't and, agree you know, more. There's no doubt about it. Oh, you know, even Dave Hitz admits, hey, yeah. we're, the, we're the plumbers you know, right. in, the, in the industry. And, yeah. and, but when, when you have cool, cold, cool water going <laughs> through the pipes, you're happy. When you don't, you're really unhappy. Yeah, yeah. But Val, you told me last night that you've been following the Hadoop movement for yeah. almost three years now. Yeah, right? since the very first Hadoop And that world. intrigued me because, yeah. because Hadoop is not in to Main top street. of mind for mainstream for most storage companies. Yeah. We were at Hadoop World last year and there weren't a lot of storage people. That was one of the very few. Right. You know, I know you had some people there. Yeah. So so what led you to sort of track Hadoop and and what does your sort of trend spotter DNA tell you about yeah. that movement? It's really, really simple. I mean, at NetApp, my, if, if I don't remember it myself, my bosses remind me all the time, we're not a charity, we're a for-profit company. And we have an addressable market. It's very much you know, targeted towards enterprises that have to operate you know, their infrastructure as efficiently as possibly as possible. So what I looked for, because there's lots of interesting technologies out there, what caught my eye with Hadoop going back three years was the fact that there was an event, Hadoop World was the fact that it wasn't in Silicon Valley, it was in New York. So they are already a, a, an implicit business mm. mentality to the event. And most importantly, even in the earliest days, there were already some what I consider bricks and mortar mainstream enterprise use cases being highlighted even three years ago in the New York Times, you know, um, basically reform and new transformation of their archives, digitization of their archives mm -hmm. was the one profile example. So that caught my eye and I thought, hey, you know what? I'll put that aside as something interesting and, and something worth watching. The year after, there was an explosion in enterprise use cases built on Hadoop. Mainstream bricks and mortar businesses, not just Web 2.0 companies with better ad placement. Right. That doesn't gain a lot of credibility in my business discussions inside NetApp because that's a niche, that's not a market. 
you know, fast forward to year three and you had a thousand plus attendees, maybe 1200. Yeah, it was mostly uh, enterprise from what I can tell, not necessarily just Web 2.0 guys. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, the dollar signs are going off and everybody's head that's watching. So it was really that bricks and mortar that not just West Coast Web 2.0 Association from the very earliest days that caught my eye and with every subsequent year of activity reinforced my notion that this is going to become yeah. infrastructure in business going forward. So, the, so you watched the early adopters, but the, it, for you it was the fact that it went from early adopters to in practice because the proverbial chasm was crossed. Yeah, and a specific kind of early adopter. It wasn't, again, it wasn't just Web 2.0 companies. It wasn't just Facebook or Twitter or Google or whatever that was using this technology. It was the fact that enterprises across multiple verticals, retail, finance, healthcare, energy, they were finding value in this technology. That's what caught my eye. So it's a different game, though, for a storage company. Like, how do you, you know, your management can remind you that you're yeah. a for-profit company. So how do you profit from Hadoop where you don't have this sort of put it all in a box mentality. Yeah. Everything's distributed. You're bringing the code to the data. What do you, what do you, I mean, it's early days, but, yeah. but can you make money at Hadoop? I think so. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm doing more. I'm actually making investments specifically. And I'll give you one example that relates to it a little bit in an open source context. When we first at NetApp started uh, seeing a lot of customer traction with production databases over NFS, for example, over Ethernet on Linux, what we found was a lot of vendors had very mature, robust uh, NFS server implementations. I mean, NetApp, of course, had one. Sun NFS server was solid. HP NFS, IBM NFS server, solid. But to run a database from a host, it was a client portion of NFS that was being stressed. And quite frankly, the client side of NFS was embarrassing from both Sun, HP, IBM. And we had no influence to you know, control that because we needed a stable client implementation to be able to support you know, production databases. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we basically started aggressively investing in contributing to the Linux kernel. And we now are the lead maintainers of the NFS client and server portions into the Linux kernel by throwing money at the problem, by investing engineering resources, and we shamed effectively by having a better Linux implementation of the NFS client, Sun, HP, and IBM, to name a few, into upping their game and having a, a robust production quality NFS client so that we could have an end-to-end -end connection. And you were an accelerant to that process. We, yeah, we had to be the case. We had to break the chicken and egg cycle, and we had to invest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the very same model can be applied now to any other open source project, including distributions of Hadoop, particularly since Hadoop is based on the BSD license in Apache. So any IP that you contribute to Hadoop, you don't necessarily have to share if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. you, if there's something that you think will differentiate you and has you know, distinguished IP there, intellectual property in that context, you can retain it. And I think that is a very business, you know, friendly, commercially, capitalist friendly model. Uh, and that's why I think that whole Hadoop ecosystem is already thriving and it's quite diverse and it'll continue to be so. As companies are adding value and they, they can monetize and retain some of that as a proprietary advantage, as well as share others. Is it a war or is it collaboration? So at the big data conference, which yeah. we, um, Giga Ohm had a, had a one day right. event in New York, New York City, yeah. um, we had a big data special that day and we were also running our clips. So we were kind of plugged into that. Um, there was a lot of discussion around yeah. competition. So there was a series of announcements, data stacks, right. uh, among others, um, competing yeah. against Cloudera. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I wrote a, p a comment on, on Derek Harris's post on Gigalone basically saying, do we have to compete? Does it have to be a war? Because as you know, in early ecosystems yeah. like this, it's industry, it's industry formation. Yeah. So there's a lot, of, a lot of money to go around. It's not like the market's small. I mean, it's a big market. It is. The Hadoop. You said it's all in the ver all the verticals, financial, government, you name them, they're all, they're all going crazy for exactly, Hadoop. Yeah. So the question is, what does the industry formation look like? It's Apache based, it's BSD licensed, yeah. so there's investment, VC, big company investments, startups, mm -hmm. what's it going to look like? Uh, How yeah, does it work? I'm going to prognosticate here obviously and just yeah. speculate, but uh, I think it is going to follow a little bit of the Linux model even though it's a different license there, but if, if anything it encourages more commercial you know, adoption. But fundamentally, uh, despite the politics in any open source movement, it's still very much a meritocracy. So I really believe that companies and organizations that invest the most in contributing to whichever distribution of Hadoop ends up becoming the ultimate one, and maybe you can live with a top two or three, you don't have to have you know, just one. Uh, that will ultimately be what most you know, enterprises or most organizations, NGOs and so forth ultimately go with. So I, I predict you know, standard Darwinistic practices for any industry where the strong will, will emerge, 
based on meritocracy, really the most contribution to the distributions. And there might be like Red Hat, say one or two dominant distributions. Uh, fragmentation, you know, will only keep the industry you know, lagging behind. And I think people will get over that pretty quickly. And, and where do you play? So it's a, a more software potentially, yes. right? And it's uh, solving problems, whether they performance or management yeah. or data protection or whatever it is, movement, The problems cetera. don't go away. Yeah. It's the same fundamental problems. It's just on a bigger scale right now. So scale is the difference between, you know, technology we sell today and technology we're selling into cloud two, into Hadoop type environments. And the ability to apply solutions for how to keep these mechanical, you know, spinning brown rust disks uh, at scale operating, for how to actually manage the data, for how to protect it, for how to make sure that you have availability of the data uh, and, and resource efficiency and utilization is a really important thing as well. We're seeing everyone focused on scale today, as they should. You know, if you have a viral application, your number one concern is keeping up with the demand. Right. But after a while, you hit a plateau, and then the joke within the company is the green visors show up. And I say, okay, now that you've hit your plateau, now that you've kept up with all the demand there is, you notice there aren't a billion Facebook users yet, right? There's still a five, six hundred million only. But they've hit a plateau. All of a sudden, efficiency matters. And that's where the, you know, the, the IP we have in the portfolio of efficiency technologies will be applied at scale. I'm not saying we have all the solutions shipping today, but those are the kinds of things we're working on. And those solutions at scale will solve the business problems and that you know were opportunities before. So you see the fundamental tenets of NetApp's efficiency approach. I mean, we heard, uh, we hear a lot about it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's dedupe and it's compression and it's yeah. snaps, et cetera, et cetera. Those fundamental capabilities you see actually carrying over into the big data movement, maybe in different forms. Exactly. Right? The qualifier is at scale. You can never forget scale in this world. And yeah, the interfaces are different, right? It's not an NFS interface anymore. It's Java, RPCs, basically is what Hadoop file system is. So the mm -hmm. interfaces are different. The core value is the same. And you know, as long as you keep the focus on scale, and you're able to be cost effective at scale, responsive at scale, supportable at scale, you have a viable solution, a detraction solution in this market. So you, me you mentioned essentially you've got to pick your spots in terms of yeah. where you put your resource. Yeah. Um, how about database? What's your, what's your vision there? What are you seeing? I mean, you guys going to go out and buy a database company? I mean, <laughs> you know, Unlikely next, so. Uh, Vertica, uh, Green I don't know Plum, if you've yeah. had a chat with Jeffrey Moore recently. Uh, I had the privilege a while back, actually, at a previous, maybe it was even SNW show, or no, it was, sorry, it was the fall show, Storage is, Developer Conference. Has he been on theCUBE? Uh, no, not yet. Get, so. him, we'll get, get, him, get him on, because he's got a couple of great terms. He describes Cloud One and Cloud Two loosely as systems of record, is Cloud One, which is very much a database environment that we're familiar with today, call them legacy, if you will, but you know they're still a thriving market, look at Oracle's results. And then there's systems of engagement which is really all about interaction, collaboration, big data, monetization, and so forth of a lot of you know, big, data sample, big data sizes versus sample sizes. So Jeff has this wonderful term. We don't replace old systems, we pave over them. Mm -hmm. right? you know, look at the BIOS that we all thought about when we were running DOS, that was really, really important. No one, you know, BIOS is still there, but it's just a, a detail now buried so far underneath OS layers, driver layers, middleware layers, database layers, that we just don't care about BIOS anymore. Same thing is happening to transactional databases. You, transactions matter. You know, when we transfer, when we buy stock or transfer funds, we really want to know that, that, that very simple from a disk capacity perspective, you know, record, text, alphanumeric oriented transaction, it has to occur, it has to occur fast, it has to be atomic. But from the grand scheme of things today, in terms of you know, all the new data types of video, the social media, the mobility of information, it doesn't, you know, it's not as relevant a portion of the IT spend anymore because it's a small, literally it's a small amount of capacity, it's a relatively finite size system that can process that, typically a scale up system, whereas all the exciting new business innovation now, enabled by big data, enabled by video, is all around you know, larger infrastructures that are, you know, scale out as opposed to scale yeah, up. Yeah. So you guys obviously are for profit and you service enterprises, but a lot of your enterprises serve end users. Yes. So there's a big consumer applications out yeah. there from, you know, whether it's a web app or financial services company. Um, the consumerization trend is obviously yeah. here now and present and it's yeah. been talked about for decade. Um, how do you look at the, the notion of personal cloud? I mean, we all have the idea that at some day, We'll have a cloud of our own, yeah. our own hybrid cloud. Many of us do, and I, yeah. we kind of, kind of do it now. I got a little Facebook here, I got a little LinkedIn here, I got yeah. you know Twitter here, and I got my hard disk yeah. on site. I got Roku channel. All this stuff's going on, yeah. um, and um, this ephemeral data trend is real. So yeah. like that brings up things like okay, that's an interesting concept, but right. what technology drives that? Virtualization, yeah. 
desktop virtualization, converged networking. So all this is kind of coming together. So, so talk about uh, what your angle is from NetApp and or how you see yeah. personally the, the desktop virtualization layer and what's going on under the covers sure. there. So I'll start with actually a business model answer to that question and I'll get to the technology. We, we realized early on we have repeated requests about two years ago, maybe even two and a half years ago, for, f from customers for NetApp to provide a storage service in the cloud. We thought long and hard about it, you know, it could have been certainly a whole new department for us, a large incremental market opportunity, and we realized we are, don't have core competency in the services business, especially the online cloud services business, and ultimately we have this term that cloud will result in an, ag an aggregation of service providers, but you basically have, you know, people that become dominant as this industry matures, and we just don't want to compete with, with ultimately we think are our best customers today, and we hope will be you know, even more of our best customers in the future. So our business model is very much around enabling service providers to be NetApp powered, but not offering NetApp, you know, native NetApp storage services. We'll offer branded, NetApp branded storage services via Terramark, T-Systems, Rackspace, other major providers of ours, BT, you know, France Telecom internationally. Uh, so we have a NetApp powered program where our salespeople are compensated neutrally with the same accelerators and quarter retirement, whether they sell gear, kit, or whether they actually sell a storage service based on a NetApp powered service provider. So that was a major effort, if you know anything about sales wow. compensation yeah, 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 programs. Yeah, yeah. That was a major 18 month effort. Yeah. And again, the technology to enable that is in my mind split along these cloud one, cloud two boundaries. So Jeffrey Moore term systems of record, it is very much about server virtualization. It's about desktop virtualization. And that's evolving towards application delivery now, more granular virtual desktop virtualization and so forth. Uh, and these new applications now that are driving big data are again a different stack, a different set of virtualization assumptions, and those are you know some of the areas of investments that we're working on right like now. Specifically, like what do you see there? What kind so, of uh, uh, changes in virtualization? So analytics is uh, something interestingly enough. You know, it's uh, the traditional data warehousing market is not a market we chased aggressively. Uh, our design center, our core technology is optimized for response time and latency, not for bandwidth. Historically, uh, hence the Ingenio acquisition. It's a very bandwidth optimized play, Teradata automatically becomes you know, a major customer of ours and a major partner of ours, uh, IBM's other storage product line aside from N-Series. So we're basically seeing these new style of applications that are not replacing the old ones, they're just complementing them, maybe paving, yeah, over them, paving over them, certainly yeah. uh, overshadowing them over time in terms of growth of the, of the dollars spent. Those are the interesting new markets that we're getting into. and. Um, Again, whether it's a, a hypervisor virtual machine-based optimization value that we have today and very much in that tornado. In fact, we've crossed the chasm. We're into mainstream adoption of virtualization technologies beyond the low-hanging fruit into the business-critical and mission-critical virtualization phases, as Maritz describes, is where we are right now. But at the same time, we're seeing this growth in custom application development in enterprise. Uh, some of these uh, applications being deployed as cloud platforms and internal platforms. And what excites me is the, the new stack that's supporting all these things, that's focused on scale, that's focused on technology such as Hadoop, uh, focused on real-time analytics databases. It's new, you know, I get bored easily, so I like new stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so talk a little bit more about the Ingenio acquisition, because yeah. um, you're implying that there's a big data angle there. Yeah. Um, so Talk about that. first and foremost, so just to be you know uh, official, it hasn't closed yet. The transaction we expect to close sometime in May. Right. And we'll, we have we'll have a lot more to say, obviously, publicly once we do that. But what we have said so far in terms of justifying the acquisition was first and foremost video. Video was not a design center for wa uh, Waffle and ONTAP, particularly high bandwidth video ingest. If you take a look at some of the applications right now, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in you know the, the classified side of government, you'll notice that they require anywhere from you know about uh, 10 to 50 gigabytes per second of sustained throughput. Wow. Right, wow, exactly. That's, That's a jaw dropper. Yeah. So it's it's not about just continuing to improve the engineering performance of our product line. That's massive. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a fundamental step shift, and mm. um, and we and we know that from USB mm. two point oh, move yeah. ten megabits per second, exactly. twenty hours exactly. takes us twenty hours to move yeah. six hundred meg. I mean gig. Yeah. To back up. So some of the predator <laughs> drones out there, to use just oh. one example, are, are are collecting a lot of video information, and that needs to be ingested and pre-processed in real time, and then certainly yeah. some retroactive processing as well. So that is a giant, giant market. Uh, it's, a, it's a large base growing as exponentially as every other data type. But if it starts off a large base, and again, this is now video becoming more of a mainstream requirement as opposed to a niche, that motivated us primarily. 
to, to go to look at the Ingenio property and to make the acquisition. Secondarily, we also looked at the fact, as I said earlier, HPC is going mainstream. And Hadoop is just an example of that. It's, you know, it's a shared nothing, massively parallel, distributed storage technology, but it's being applied to a lot of business problems as opposed to research academic problems. And it turns out the, uh, the Ingenio product line is, again, as optimized for that in terms of high performance, low cost, dense storage characteristics that we didn't optimize, you know, Waffle and ONTAP for. So it's completely incremental market opportunity, completely incremental workloads, uh, and quite clearly you'll never be seeing us position, you know, Ingenio as a SAN alternative to ONTAP and Waffle for Oracle, for Exchange, for VMware. Uh, we, we're gaining so much share in those markets with our existing technology today that it'd be foolish for us to do that. Yeah, so, um, and John, you know I like to to pontificate from a financial <laughs> standpoint, right? I mean, I was pretty vocal about EMC's yeah. de decrease in core value last year. In VMware. And, and, yeah, and, and VMware, cap. we've been, uh, and, and we've we seen some changes there. One of the things I've said about the Ingenio acquisition is essentially NetApp picked it up for, I don't know, less than a, less than, less than a dollar, you know, on a revenue basis. Less than 1x revenue. That's okay, but NetApp's deal. trading at, let's say, four, maybe yeah, four times revenue. So the day they do that acquisition, their investors get an immediate bump. I, I've said th at least three to four times. So if, the, if they're paying 400 yeah. million, you're talking about a, a billion dollar plus valuation hit just for that acquisition, you know, assuming they can keep some of that revenue, but there's a lot of, I mean. I mean, George, and we asked George is that at the, on theCUBE, um, yeah. Tom, and the CEO of NetApp, you know, about ask them what? innovation, about M&A. Oh and, yeah. You know, yeah, you're going to yeah, grow absolutely. organically innovation, but this is the deal, and you know, LSI was, you guys recently got involved yeah. in that deal. These are bargains. I mean, you can't pass up yep. a killer value, right? right? I mean, is that kind of the philosophy? I mean, of course you're going to do innovation. Well, but, it's an undervalued you know, asset. It they, was a great Warren Buffett play. It had a good brand. I mean, maybe not a 75-year-old yeah. brand, but you know, in our world. That's a good it's headline, a good though. It's almost a Warren Buffett yeah. approach yeah, to tech yeah, investing, which is rare. It's in undervalued. Case, uh, yeah. It's a value yeah. play. Yeah. IBM yeah, makes those same moves, too. I mean, IBM yeah. is known for making those so, kind of moves. So I'm presuming your assumptions are you're going to increase revenue. It's not gonna, you're not going to decrease revenue. But even if you do, you, it's still, from an M&A standpoint, a good deal. So I'm on record as saying it's a smart financial move, you know, again, assuming you can manage it right and grow right. the revenue, yeah. it's a it's a The markets it's you mentioned are, anyway. are, are big markets. I mean, yeah. if that yeah. truly materializes into the value yeah. you're mentioning, big data across multiple verticals, yeah. given the fact that that was a, a, a an area that you needed to have from an HPC standpoint, yeah, yeah, it should do well. Yeah. You won't lose customers, you'll gain customers. Yeah, no, we, we predict the full motion video opportunity alone over the next couple of years justifies the acquisition by itself, regardless of the large OEM revenue that's already part of the acquisition, yeah. regardless of HPC going mainstream in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Full motion video alone justified the acquisition. And again, I'm very excited about all the ancillary technologies because you know, they're hot, they're, they're closer to my area of expertise and passion. So um, well, it's, speaking it's, it's of, all gravy. Speaking of, of one of those sort of fringe uh, technologies, object, yep. you know, you got an object play yep. in Bicast, and uh, um, what's going on there? I mean, what do, you, what do you see as the potential for object? I mean, it's so uh, I chair, as some of you might know, the S Cloud Storage Initiative which is basically the marketing and education arm of the technical working group in charge of the first cloud standard, which SNIA happens to have, have released. That's the cloud data management interface. That is all about an object interface to storage that's completely cloud optimized, you know, very cloud friendly. The benefits of object are back to that one characteristic that distinguishes this new generation of cloud scale. What, you know, it's heretical for a file systems company like NetApp to say this, but the truth is, as you get to exascale of data, as it gets to many billions and trillions of individual objects that you know in organizations have to manage, um, you just are, you're exceeding the design goals of file POSIX compliance file systems designed 30 years ago. Having to structure things in folders, hierarchical folders, having to look up, you know, file names and open files and seek to a certain region of a file, that's just way too much overhead for where this world is already here and going. So an object-based interface lets you abstract, you know, the location of the, uh, the file or the object from, you know, how you're accessing it and what the application of the user needs gives you that flexibility to have, you know, either a flat namespace of billions or trillions of objects without having to have folders, or it just says, you know what, I care about the data much more than who last accessed it at what time or who owns it. I need to know how many people access it. I need to have legal holds associated with that file. I need to have other democratic demographic information associated with that object, and I don't want to have that spread across three or four different databases that might become inconsistent over time. I want the metadata, metadata tagged to the object directly. 
that's the freedom and flexibility that object storage uh, offers you and standards like CDMI are definitely catalysts for driving more rapid adoption. Yeah, okay, so what's the play there? Are you, uh, does ONTAP speak, speak object? Is that, is that where this goes? So Bycast, the Bycast acquisition, which is now the storage grid product line, NetApp storage grid, is all about gaining all the expertise in terms of the management layer and the interface layer for object storage. Mm -hmm. We obviously have a lot of core competency in just storing lots of bits of data very reliably, very economically, very rapidly we don't have a lot of experience in is object interfaces for doing that. So we know NFS cold, we know fiber channel cold, iSCSI, SIFs, you know, but um, emerging object interfaces which have been proprietary in the past because it's an API until the standard emerged. Certainly the most credible viable standard is the CDMI standard. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we basically, without having announced, I think, a product yet, uh, Miseo Software did that on Monday, so I was very proud to see that. Certainly, it's cherry in the CSI. Uh, but we have all sorts of intentions in making sure that this standard, which we're strategically investing in, is the object interface standard. And we want to be a dominant player in object storage using this yeah. interface. So, so I have a question for you, uh, just to kind of change gears a little bit. Obviously, you're in Silicon Valley, NetApp's known uh, to be a very big success story for many, many in Silicon Valley, including the investors. Ottawa. Like, so, like, <laughs> like, 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 like Sequoia. Um, and we, you know, we follow you on Twitter, so we see your, yeah. your patterns. You're scouring you know, the web. Uh, yeah. You're actually we're doing research and going to events. What are the hot areas um, that you see within the, this economy that we're yeah. living in, in terms of like, from a startup standpoint and from emerging technology. Yeah. I mean, we haven't talked about automation. We right. hear a lot from developers that in the automation challenge with this mm -hmm. new migration, this new this transformation going on is a hot area. Um, what areas do you see? I mean, you're out you know, in the hinterlands of the yeah. tech land. What are you seeing so that's hot? These, hey, I love these areas. I'll, I'll give you data. one that I'm looking at, in fact, actively researching very, very closely, and it's, it's a bit of an, an emerging one. You might not have heard of it yet, or hopefully you have, and it's more of a trend, and it's a category of, of technologies called DevOps. Yeah. One word. Yeah. Not sure if you guys have heard of it yet, or yeah, if we you're hearing chatter it. about yep. it. Mm -hmm. yep. I'd love to know if you're chatter about it at this show, because I'd be no, you know, no particularly zero interested. Chatter, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think the spring source, that open source crowd, where it you begins. have that infrastructure automation, the right scale kind of. But I think the maturity, basically, of you know fusing two very separately minded organizations, people that are paid to resist change, operations, mm -hmm. and people that thrive on change, application developers, having those two cultures merge, get together, and apply you know agile techniques, not just the development, which is the most progressive way to write software today, but the infrastructure, managing your infrastructure programmatically, version controlling your infrastructure, applying all sorts of you know uh, dependency rules so that you can get as complex and fine-grained as you want and still manage the firmware on a million disk drives on a thousand Hadoop nodes at scale. Being able to do that without you know humans involved, but just programming that, uh, that is a, a cool. We, 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 we talk about programmable infrastructure. We actually, are, we actually are following that, and, yeah. and you know, we don't talk about it because it's not a real market for that. But you know, yeah. what you're talking about is the pure play cloud guys, yeah. right? Guys who have no legacy. Exactly. I mean, all the young entrepreneurs that, I, that we're seeing with DevOps is they got a clean sheet of paper. Yeah. They have no legacy baggage. They go, yeah. "Hey, I'm a coder. What's this? Yeah. Amazon. This is so easy. Yeah. I can pay on a credit card." But they get Amazon as a programming right. environment not as an operational in, IT In my plumbing. mind, Amazon are the leading example of DevOps internally yes. as an organization. They've always programmed their infrastructure, they've always used it, maybe initially for efficiency, but they quickly tossed that yeah. like early last decade and focused on agility and the ability to yeah. deliver innovation more quickly. My, my vision on this is, um, is, is that DevOps is going to emerge into, um, and I haven't written a blog post about it yet, but since you brought it up, I'll get on the record yeah. and probably be correct uh, in, 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 in the future, is that you're talking about programming infrastructure. Yes, I am. I mean, that's exactly what this is. This is not yeah. about IT and plumbing. It's about programming infrastructure. Well, it's going to have to be about IT, right? Because this is where IT inevitably is going, particularly IT operations. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so if you don't recognize this trend early enough, if you don't start to reach out and understand your developers, if you don't have some kind of comfort in programming an infrastructure versus just operating it, you're going to be left behind sooner or and later. And the, the clash of the titans in this battle is going to be, can the ops guys let go of their fiefdoms? You know, whether it's fiber channel, you yeah. mentioned the debate was going on in, in your session. Just The programmers just want things coded and done, right? So you got a developer mindset yeah. and the ops mindset. I mean, they're completely different mindsets. And don't you agree? Yeah, I agree how do they, how do they? The how developers do they? are driving this naturally, but the developers aren't being naive about this. It's not about forcing IT operations to cater to their will. It's about developers realizing that operations is hard. 
and actually you know, writing better, more fault-tolerant applications, yeah. more self-aware applications, more instrumented applications. So it is a bit of a give and take. I don't, it's not yeah, one-sided, yeah. which is what excites me. And it's a young movement. It's a very early yeah. movement. It's a global movement because it started in Europe, yeah. in Brussels, yeah. actually, yeah. and it's yeah. spreading over now and becoming quite topical here. So I think... And um, there's some successes, too. Look at Heroku, a great yeah. example, sold yeah. to Salesforce. Exactly. These kinds of environments yeah. are out there. I'm a big believer in this as the future of IT. I and totally agree with uh, you. How totally you agree scale with you. applications in the cloud and operations of those scalable apps in the cloud. Yeah, I think I totally agree with you. I think you're 100% correct on that one. Um, the challenge will be in IT is how fast does it infiltrate the enterprise? Cultural and organizational so, will be the challenge. So this yeah. might be where the online service providers become the gateway infrastructure for those yeah. guys. Because if you're a programmer, you're going to go where it's frictionless, right? Yeah. Either you do it yourself. There, there are sea changes every yeah. decade or so in this industry, <laughs> and I predict you know this is going to be a sea change for IT ops. Um, Appli you know, enterprise application developers actually went through a really rough phase ten years ago when a lot of that work was outsourced overseas, mm. and they've kind of come to an equilibrium now where they're business analysts and certainly innovators now yeah. in terms of big data, value to a company, data-driven value. So that sea change now is being forced upon IT yeah, operations. Yeah. I said in my um, in my breakout to be melodramatic, just so it stuck, that ultimately cloud is nothing more than a massive assault on IT operations by developers, if you really think about it I to its totally end, end you. game over yeah. time. And you, know, you have to sort of realize, wake up to that reality yeah. and, and adapt. So it, yeah. If they can do it at scale, I think this is where I think the lever will ultimately push that and just kind of yeah. prognosticating is that if the scale, you brought up scale, because I think that's the pivot point. If scale change can happen at scale, then you've got success. Yeah. That's where the winner will come the from. The economics don't work if it doesn't work at scale, yeah. and the economics yeah. ultimately trump all. So is cloud the final resting place for uh, IT operations? Is that uh, uh, As far as we can see, yeah. and of course, things will change. You know, come 2020, <laughs> in fact, I recommend um, you spend some time looking at the, the published works recently of Bill Coleman, founder of BEA, and, you know, father of Solaris and so forth. He's at a VC now. And uh, I had the pleasure of looking you know, or participating in one of his presentations where he spoke about the evolution of cloud and pretty much decade boundaries. Cloud one, as we saw, you know, ending in 2010, more or less, uh, the peak of innovation. Cloud two, really, in this decade. And he already had cloud three laid out quite eloquently starting in 2020, 2030. And even some of the implications on humanity beyond that when you have all sorts of computing available as a complete utility. Mm. So I think it's fascinating where this is going and there, there, there will be something beyond the end of IT. Well, let's we not stop here. We're in Palo Alto. Want to get you more in, involved in some of these conversations. Yeah. One, DevOps, one, I think, is that's the franchise topic right there. Yeah. We could love to pound that home. Sure. Uh, I'm interested in that. Obviously, Hadoop, yeah. the big data stuff, and also just the change at the infrastructure level because you know this is going to be a massive, fun, run for I, IT and tech guys. It is. I mean, it's already, you know, very frothy <laughs> investment-wise, right? I mean... Change brings you know, opportunity. Yeah. There's so plenty of change. People so. are going to make a lot of money yes. and good stuff's going to happen, right? Absolutely. There'll be some dead bodies, yeah, but, you yeah. know, um, but it's going to be fun. There will be, and the, you know, there's going to be a, an open source angle here that'll loom larger than ever yeah. before yeah. in commercial solutions, money-making ventures. So that that angle too will be fascinating to watch. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, I constantly ask the question, how do you make money at open source? Well, we're seeing it all around us. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's and and it's interesting. It's refreshing to hear uh, an executive at a storage company talking about some of these trends. Yeah. You typically yeah. don't yeah. hear that from the storage world. You don't hear a lot of it at the show. Mm -hmm. That's why I was. Really, really happy, Val, that you came on, on the and show. And we got some startups coming on, too. Um, we'll hear from them. Yeah. That's where we get a lot of good good content from the startups because they're on they're on the total front lines, That's right? So My biggest value of all of these shows literally is to network and meet these interesting emerging technologies and startups. That's, you know, I, I know our sales and marketing department love the sales leads. I selfishly go, <laughs> and, you know, I go for the networking. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Get the content. Well, thanks exactly. for coming in the Cube. We really appreciate it. We've been had you on our list for a long time, <laughs> target list. Yeah. Val Berkovici, uh, 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 great prognosticator, trend spotter, uh, tr uh, very Twitter candid. aficionado. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. candid. Really appreciate Thanks your so insight. Thanks so much. Appreciate Absolute it. Pleasure. Really a pleasure. All right. To be on Cheers. Here. All right, Dave.